Y'all, what remained of my inner child, like the last little teensy bit of it, literally got up and ran away after I watched this. Today we are talking about McMillions and the reason that my inner child was like, oh no, everything innocent has left me is because I was like, are you kidding me? The only thing we ever had a chance for winning was like Big Macs and French fries, which do not get me wrong. If you know me by now, I'm like, sadly, that's enough for me. I could do with that more so than the million dollars. So y'all, this was a six part series that was on HBO. Today we're gonna be talking about the parts that jumped out at me, some of the characters in it, and the general like scheme of how the scam worked. So again, the documentary is called McMillions. Actually, one of the executive producers was Mark Wahlberg. So you know, we were like, okay. So this is revolving around the Monopoly game that was at McDonald's. And this was, you know, way back when, this is a hot minute ago, so back in the 90s and stuff. If you remember playing this game, if you played things similar, you know, pretty much you were almost going to always win. So it really did have this thing of like, wow, even the regular person can win. Well, what this documentary shows us is that no, the regular person couldn't win because the people at the top or the person at the top who was stealing from this game. So let's go ahead and talk about how this went about. The series starts off with the FBI agent, Doug Matthews. Y'all, he needs his own television show. He has a thousand and fifty million percent personality. He is just this like over the top, really nice, easy on the eye, Southern guy telling the story and he draws you into it. So basically he sees a little note on one of his co-workers desk that says something like McDonald's scam and he's like what is that and that starts this whole thing off. So it begins this investigation into what will unearth this huge scam going on with the game. At the center point of this is somebody named Uncle Jerry. The scam went on for 10 years. Now there are two central questions that kind of make you say, what is it, what is it, what is it the whole time? For me those were, how did he do it? It seems so complicated, so how did he get away with it? And also, who was the informant? Who tipped them off? Now we're gonna answer all of that. So let's start with the investigation. So like I said, the FBI is involved. They start out this investigation called Operation Final answer. Now they work with a lady from McDonald's, Amy Murray, who she actually works with these winners. And basically it's almost like, we want you to do your job, but you're gonna be doing it with us now. They start up a fake production company. And essentially they're just like, look, we're gonna just kind of go about this like we normally would. So they do two things with this production company. Number one, they do another run of the game to essentially be like, who wins and what do they say? And like, how can we figure out what's going on? And they also do like a reunion of the winners and this is when they go back to all these winners and when you start seeing the winners come back who agreed to do the reunion you're like eh, did you not think to line some of the story up so during this they're going to the winners homes and you know they're interviewing them whether it be the new game or for the other aspect of the reunion they're asking them tons of questions and we're seeing them fall all over themselves in some situations because it's almost like they just didn't think it through completely as well as other ones are starting to be like why are they asking me this like you know they have a guilty conscience so let's just talk quickly about a couple of the people that we meet we meet a guy named buddy fisher bless his heart he's everything you imagine out of a person named Buddy Fisher. He's just this, you know, cool little Southern dude, little Farmer Joe type person. He is shook on camera. I mean, to the point that they're almost like making fun of him a little bit like, oh, you're really sweaty there, buddy. Uh, here's this. And they're asking him these questions that he's just kind of fumbling around through. So it almost gives it this dynamic, like the FBI is completely trolling these people. We meet another lady named Gloria Brown. Now, I actually really loved Gloria Brown in this. If you're watching, I mean, you kind of captured my heart in this. I felt bad for her. I honestly consider her kind of like a victim almost. But she comes forward, she does the reunion thing, and she's doing all this stuff and recounting the day. And they're like, well, why were you living in you know, South Carolina and doing this and doing that? And I mean, she's fumbling through these lies. They have her sign a picture of the McDonald's that she says is where she won the ticket, but it's the wrong McDonald's. So again, with the FBI, they're getting all this information on these people like this on videotape. They're 
basically having them testify against themselves, but at the same time, it's almost like they're trolling them because the main investigator dude, his personality is just so amazing. And the questions he's asking, it's almost like you're on an inside joke with them. So essentially they narrow things down to two people during all of this. They're, I mean, they're tapping phones, they're going through phone records, and they're like, wait a minute, after they, these people went and before they went, there's all these phone calls coming here and there and did, 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 did. So amazingly enough, they, they track it down to two people. And amazingly, both of their names are Jerry. So one of them, Jerome Jerry Jacobson, former cop, he is like the head of security for a marketing firm called Simon Marketing. Simon Marketing is who actually does the game for McDonald's. McDonald's himself doesn't do this, obviously. They outsource it and went to Simon Marketing. They were global at the time, and they have all these offices. And McDonald's, as you can imagine, is probably one of their biggest clients. They have some other ones. One sidestep to this documentary that's like, if you're not in it for the true crime part, this part's interesting, is to watch the security that obviously didn't work, but that went behind this game at Simon Marketing and other places, how it's all done. You know, it's amazing. Now, of course, back then they weren't doing like the go online and get this, you know, ticket number and all that stuff. So it was done differently. But that aspect of this is really, really intriguing. Now, the other Jerry is a guy named Jerry Colombo. You might recognize that last name as the mob. So part of the documentary is trying to decide who's Uncle Jerry, who's Uncle Jerry. Well, Uncle Jerry, the main Jerry or whatever, is the Simon Marketing guy. Now, from the other Jerry, the mobster Jerry, we're going to hear from you know his former wife, Robin. We're going to hear from his brother and all these other people. So we're not going to talk about every last one of them. Again, definitely watch the documentary. I'm just going to talk about the ones that spoke to me that I feel are relevant to go over here. So between Jerry's former wife and his brother and his his wife Heather they basically tell us how this whole scheme went down you know and of course the way they're laying it out at this time a big question is like well how did the head guy actually do this and nobody really knows but essentially what was going on is this Uncle Jerry was stealing the cards the tickets the winning tickets and we'll talk about how he did that in just a minute he would get the tickets and he would sell them to mobster Jerry. And so Uncle Jerry was basically going to him and say, you know, for X amount of dollars, I'm giving you these tickets. And mobster Jerry was like, okay. So then mobster Jerry would go to people and approach them. Now, some of these were family members, acquaintances. He even picked up one lady, you know, at an airport. So he got, in my opinion, a little messy with it. And that would be what kind of brought him down later in the game. But he would go to them and basically be like, hey, look, here's a million dollar ticket. I'm going to split the money with you. This is what's going to happen. We're going to create a story around it. We're going to give you a fake address. Yada, yada, yada. So again, they would split the money. And one person in here who really breaks it down is Gloria, how she says the money was broken down. Yeah, so McDonald's would pay them like $50,000 a month. Can you imagine getting $50,000 a month? Well, it's not all that great. She would give half of that to Mobster Jerry. And so that's $25,000 tax free. Well, she's left having to pay the taxes. And then, two, the guilty conscience, because she was like, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Like I said, he met one person, Lee Cassano, who he gave like a $100,000 ticket to. Well, he never gave her her money. And so she's going to be a huge part in this because eventually she has to cough up money that she owed the IRS almost to the tune of $50,000. So it almost became like moving from this like white collar crime of ripping this thing off to victimizing people, making these people owe lots of money that they weren't even really getting anything for. Let's revisit Gloria Brown again for a second. Now she goes into detail about how this happened, how, you know, Robin and Jerry were like, come visit us. We have a proposition. We can't talk on the phone. She goes there, they explain it. And from the get go, she basically says she felt pressured into doing it. And so she explained the whole thing, you know, like this is what it's going to happen. And eventually, you know, she goes along with it. And she says that the day of it, you know, Jerry and some other dude picked her up. They were telling her what to say, what to do. They went around the corner and parked, sent her into a McDonald's. And so she said, you know what, even if I wanted to back out of it, I just felt like these mobsters were involved and I had no choice. She's another one who I honestly felt like, okay, she kind of made a bad choice, but I also felt like she was a victim. Now she says when she went into the McDonald's, everyone's like, oh my God, oh my God. And she was just like, <laughs> oh, lucky me. And like I said, we hear from Columbus former wife in this a lot and she's pretty much everything you're gonna imagine from a mob wife I mean she's you know got some things going on there 
nonetheless, she gives a very, she's an interesting person to watch. She gives a good idea of some things that happened and maybe some things that probably didn't. But essentially, she has a tumultuous relationship with her husband, Colombo, you know, and, and all his little endeavors don't help. You know, he's trying to open strip bars. He has affairs, this, that, the other. So there's that going on. So at one point, her Colombo and her very young child, who's still in a car seat, are driving one night. They have been fighting. Essentially, they get hit by a truck on the passenger side and where Columbo was. Uh, luckily, at the time, everyone's okay. The boy was fine. She was fine. It seemed like Columbo was fine, but he gets sent to the hospital, and basically, he never comes out. Apparently, he had internal injuries that they didn't catch, and he died. Well, this does not go over well. First of all, Columbo's mother completely blamed her for it. Like it was a hit. Like she intentionally did it. Now, allegedly, there was a robbery at the house soon after, and all of their valuables were stolen. It is hinted at that most likely the wife did it to make it look like strangers breaking them. Now, at this point, also, we find out that Columbo's brother goes and takes the remaining tickets from his house and destroys them and gets rid of them. So, supposedly, like, game over at this point. Well, now the documentary switches over to another guy who essentially takes over Columbo's role. Now, this is a Mormon real estate developer named Dwight Baker. He slowly takes this over, dealing with Uncle Jerry directly. And his story is very interesting because it's a, kind of the last person you would expect to be doing something like this. But then you see the hypocrisy of him and his wife. So basically he starts doing this and he's selling the tickets and being like, well, just get me a car or just get me this or whatever. Well, one of the people he sells a ticket to is his foster son. Now, his foster son, George Chandler, basically went and lived with him and his family, you know, probably sometime in his earlier years, not as a young person. And they basically acted as his family. There were some issues at home and whatnot. Now, George Chandler would go on to be a self-made man. And don't get me wrong, most of these people buying these tickets, y'all, they already had money. Okay, they weren't hurting. So, back to Dwight. So, Dwight sells a ticket to his foster son, but he sells it to him saying, look, I have a friend, he's going through a divorce, he won this ticket, he doesn't want it to go and to be split up, he's selling it for a hundred grand type situation. His foster son buys it and goes through with the ticket. And again, I feel like he's a victim. I feel like, you know, is it a little grimy to buy a ticket in this, under those circumstances? Yeah, a little bit. But he didn't know the real deal. So there's that. Now, another person that Dwight sells him to that comes of interest in this documentary is his sister-in-law, who she decides she's going to run off with his cut of the money he's supposed to get and bring back to Uncle Jerry. So him and his wife are having to chase her down to the damn airport where she's ready to take off and run. And I'm like, that's a real lovely family. So literally, it's you see how these tickets, this money, it just brings out the worst in all these people. Now, by the time this new guy is doing this, Dwight, the Mormon real estate guy, the FBI is onto this. They're watching this. This is, everybody's on the radar now. They've been gathering evidence. They've been doing this. And so they get all this stuff lined up and they go out in one day and start doing a sweep of all these people. They kind of go out with this mindset of, you know what, if the people talk and like give us info, we're going to let them sit and ride. Not, not take them to jail right then, but if they don't cooperate, we're going to arrest them. Well, most everybody cooperated. You know, and Gloria does a really good recounting when this happened she was like, oh my God, here it is. I knew this was coming down the pipeline. I knew it was. And she was shocked when they just let her stay. You know, she's like, well, at least I can kind of get myself together to get ready to go to prison for probably a very long time. So, like I said, the show at this point is now getting ready to show us like, look, they've all been caught. There's like 53 defendants, I think. And the biggest thing throughout this is how in the hey diddle diddle did this guy do this? When the security is shown for how these tickets are run and produced and put on there, it is crazy, y'all. Now, one thing to talk about before we say that is we have to also remember, while sometimes it seems like victimless crimes, this put the, the printing business out of business. It put the marketing firm out of business. 
all these innocent people lost their jobs all because of Uncle Jerry and this whole scheme. Because obviously when this came out, it was like, I mean, you can imagine the stock plummeted for the marketing company. I mean, this was horrible PR. So y'all, how did Jerry get the damn game pieces? Okay, the security, like I said, is insane for the game pieces. But he was the head of security for the marketing firm. So he would meet a woman outside source they would go as a team with the winning tickets to the printing press to basically be like we're doing a winning ticket run we're going to be present locked room all this stuff so he they depicted him with a briefcase handcuffed to his arm she would have a code and he would have a code neither of them knew each other's code to both open it so and they would be around each other all the time now what was going on though is when they went to the airport he would go into like you know like frequent flyers bathroom or something like that regardless she wasn't going to the men's bathroom with him so he would go to the men's bathroom along the way somewhere he had stolen her code so he could access the briefcase but that's not all he had to do there were these like little silver hologram type stickers that sealed an envelope inside there. So you open the briefcase, there's a sealed envelope with signatures on it, with the winning tickets in there. And it would say the number on the outside, like 37. Well, he would already come and ha he would have like a ton of like fake, not fake tickets, but like not winning tickets, like, you know, Big Mac, whatever. So he would come with all that stuff on him and he would just count them out and switch them out. Now the clincher to it is, how did he get past the hologram sticker? Well, you're not going to believe this. He had accidentally received a shipment of the stickers at work. So he had a surplus of them, y'all. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. So he would just take a new damn sticker and put it on there, seal it up and go on their way. And I mean, they said like, oh yeah, when he would come here, he'd make a big spectacle about, now look, y'all, I take my job serious. I wear a bulletproof vest and da 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 da. And they're like, the whole time it was a complete sham he was ripping everybody off so you know and everybody said he didn't really even act like he ever thought about the fact of when all these innocent people lost their jobs whatever so the trial lasted like three weeks long like i said there's 53 defendants they said all but seven of them pleaded guilty before the trial they said once the prosecutors did their opening statements two more pled guilty and then there are five people that went to trial now one of those people was the foster son and he was found guilty now he was only sentenced to probation he would go on to appeal that and win because essentially it was like look nobody knew that these were stolen game pieces you know overall i mean none of the people even the ones that knew they were doing something shady by buying it they didn't know that it was stolen originally i mean you could put two and two together but that has to be a component of it. Now, especially him, who he was told a complete lie. I felt really good seeing him get his thing flipped over. I was like, you know what? You made a mistake. It cost him his reputation. I mean, he paid in many other ways. Now, Gloria Brown, remember her? She just had to pay restitution. Robin Colombo, the wife of Colombo, she was found guilty. She served 18 months in prison. Now, there were many other ones, but of course, we're probably all curious. What happened to Uncle Jerry? Y'all, he got three years prison and he had to pay back $12 million, which to, to the tune of like 350 bucks a month. My thought process is this. I'm like, if he doesn't have millions and millions of dollars stashed away somewhere, I mean, hello. So, you know, it was very interesting to see these verdicts and stuff like that. And I mean, a lot of these people ended up going back and talking to each other. The foster son still talks to his, you know, foster dad, Dwight Baker. They've all kind of come to terms with it. One of the people actually became friends with the prosecutor. So there's that. Now the last dying question of this that they build you up to is, who is the damn informant? So there's kind of like a whole plethora of everybody thinks they're in the informant, but the two main ones. The woman who called the IRS, who Colombo left with a huge bill for her taxes, she called and told the whole damn story to the IRS. And she's like, after that, I never heard from anybody. Like, she wasn't involved in anything else. She's like, it's like I never participated in it. So we were all like, oh, okay, it was her. It made its way back to the FBI, whatever. Well, hold on. Then at the end of it, we learn from Colombo's brother. He says that his own mother was the informant. She called and reported everyone in. But what she did and why she did it, she wanted to keep her grandson, Robin's son, her, her late son's son, in her care. 
So she called and reported Robin Colombo and her side of the family, not saying anything about her son and their side of the family. Well, of course, you know, they do way deeper investigations, all this type of stuff, and it goes even further. So the documentary leaves us off saying, yeah, his own mother turned her in in order to keep her grandchild. Now, at the very end, we see that all these people are still talking to each other. Robin is actually friends with her now. You know, years have gone by since this happened. Now, one thing people say is like, and I said this too when it happened, when 9-11 happened, it basically took over the headlines and everybody forgot about this case. And it just went unknown. So now, years later, I'm like, wait, I remember the Monopoly game. I remember that. What's going on with that? And that's what happened. So anyways, again, I highly recommend this. You will rip through it. It is a wonderful documentary. Six parts, HBO. I'm sure it'll be available on other platforms soon now that it's played out. And that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this. And I'll talk to you soon.